Good morning, class. Here's exam one review limits covering sections 1.6, 2.1 through 2.5 and 3.1. All right, so again, exam one review limits uh, sections of 1.6, 2 1.1 through 2.5 and 3.1. Sequences and difference equations. Here's a question from exam review, question number four. Find the general term for this case, six thirds minus 10 over nine, 14 over 27, and so forth. This is as interesting as it gets uh, and as complicated as it gets. We're gonna cut it into three parts. We notice the sign alternates. We would uh, separate the numerator from the denominator and we would, figure out each one and we plug it in. So starting with the sign, the sign is either negative one to the power of n or negative one to the power of n minus one. The question is which one? If you choose this one, when n is one, you the first term takes a negative sign, but this is positive. If you choose this one, the first one, n is one, negative one to the power of zero becomes positive one. So this would be the choice. If you write out the numerator, 6, 10, 14, and so forth, you notice the first term is 6, and then we add 4, which means we have an arithmetic sequence, and we write a1 is 6, d is 4, and therefore a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. We distribute by replacing the a sub 1 with 6 and d with 4, it simplifies to 4n plus 2 because this part is 4n minus 4. We write the denominators and we notice the first term is 3 and this is being multiplied by 3 to get 9, multiplied by 3 to get 27. It's a geometric sequence with the first term being 3 and r being 3. Therefore, a sub n is a sub 1 r to the power of n minus 1. Replace the a sub 1 with 3, r with 3. And notice, we use the product rule for exponentials. This is to the power of 1. If we add these two, we get 3 to the power of n. And now, all we have to do, plug in everything that we found. So we decide that this is negative one to the power of n minus one. The numerator is four n plus two and the denominator is three over n. More importantly, we must check, meaning if you replace the n with one, do you get the first one? If you check for the first one, at least one minus one is zero, negative one to the power of zero is positive one. And a four times one is four plus two. The numerator is six, three to the power of one is three, so this is equal to six thirds, and I leave it for you to check the rest of them. So you must check the second one, the third one, just to be on the safe side. Find the first five terms of the sequence, a sub n equals two to the power of n minus four. You may remember it from the lecture. So if I replace the n with one, I get two to the power of one minus four, which makes it negative two. If I replace it with two, two squared minus four makes it zero. If I replace it with three, two cubed, eight minus four makes it four. And here's the five terms. We did this one also. We want to find the first six terms of the recursive sequence. A sub one is one, a sub two is two, a sub n plus two is a sub n plus one plus two a sub n. So we have the first two terms, we need four more. According to the general term, a sub n plus two equals a sub n plus one plus two a sub n means if I want a term, I pick the previous one and then plus two times the one before that. So if I want a sub three, it's the previous one is a sub two and the one before that is a sub one. So a sub two plus two times a sub one, which makes it two plus two times one, four. 
Now, the next one is a sub four. So according to this, a sub four is a sub three plus two, a sub two, which makes it four plus two times two, eight. And we can continue with the rest of them as long as we can show work for two. That means we can handle all of them. Limits of sequences, example one, finding sequential limits. And I'm reminding you before we look at those of a couple of uh, uh, theorems, the limit of R to power of n as n approaches infinity depends on the value of the base. If it's between negative one and one, the base R, it's zero. If it's one becomes one. And if it's larger than one becomes infinity. And with that being the case two to the power of infinity, according to this becomes infinity because all we have to do to find limits simply plug in and observe so when i plug in i get infinity which means the sequence diverges you'll have to write that unless you ask in this case if i plug in I use the fact that a to the power of minus m is one over a to the power of m, which makes this one, this part, over two to the power of infinity, which makes it zero, five and zero, they add up to five, so it converges. For this one, just replace the n with infinity, a number, no matter how large it is, over infinity is zero, so they add up to one, it therefore converges. You're dealing with a rational function where n is approaching infinity, therefore we must divide by the highest degree term in the denominator because it ends up being infinity over infinity. And so the technique is to divide by n squared. We end up with the following. As you know, every piece, as n approaches infinity, this one, this one, this one, this one, all of them go to zero, the answer is two over five. They express 0 0.46 bar as a rational number, a fractional format, and we know it's a repeating decimal or 0 0.4646 and it continues indefinitely. So we are going to write in two different formats. If we want to write it as a fractional form, this one is 46 over 100. The second piece is 46, 46 over 10,000 or 100 squared and so forth. If we want to write it as a decimal, this is 0.46, this is 0 0.0046 and so forth. So we are adding up what becomes a geometric sequence with the first term being 46 over 100 or 0.46. What is R? This number is 100 times larger than this. This fraction is 100 times smaller than this. So R is 1 over 100 or 0 0.01. And when R is between negative 1 and 1, we can use this formula to find the geometric series because we are adding them up. So we are going to go with this formula. And A is this number, or is this number. If we want to go with the fractional format, if we want to go with the decimal format, this is 0 0.46, and this is 1 minus 0 0.01. As far as the fractional format, you are dealing with a 
complex fraction, you're going to multiply by 100 over 100. The top obviously becomes 100, and the bottom becomes... One hundred minus one or ninety-nine. If you were to deal with just the decimals, the numerator would be zero point four the six. One minus point zero one would be zero point ninety-nine, which is the same as four the six over nine. In this case, the difference is that the repeating part is only one of the decimals, not all of them. So it's three point one six 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 six. And this is the part we are going to work on. And we are going to write it in two ways. In a fractional format, this is 6 over 100. This is 6 over 1,000 and so forth. In decimal format, this is 0.06. This is 0 0.006 and so forth. So again, you're dealing with the geometric sequence where this part of it, of course, we are looking at this part. that it's a geometric sequence, we are adding them up, becomes a geometric series with the first term being either 6 over 100 or 0.06 is the same thing. And, or this is 10 times larger than this, the fraction is 10 times smaller, so one over 10, or if you go with the decimal 0.1, again, this indicates we can use A over one minus R, and we do that. So remember, the 3.1 is not going to go away. It's, it's going to remain unchanged. And this is the part that we can use uh, either the fractional format or the decimal format. I can write this as 0 0.06 and write this as 1 minus 0 0.1. If I go with the fractional format, I have to multiply this complex fraction by 100 over 100. And this becomes 6 and this becomes 100 minus 10. And so I have 3.1 here and I have six over 90 here. If I go with the fraction, if, if I go with the decimal format, I have 0 0.06 over 0 0.9, which is the same as six over 90. 6 over 90 is the same as 2 over 30. 1 over 10 is the same as 3 over 30. So we get 5 over 30, which is 1 over 6. And if they don't accept that, you have to write it as 3 times 6, 18 and 1, 19 over 6. So they may expect you to write it, to write it as an improper fraction. A doctor prescribes a 100 milligram of antibiotic tablet to be taken every eight hours just before each tablet is taken. 30% of the drug present in the preceding time step remains in the body. How much drug is left after the third tablet? Write the expression for Q sub n plus one in terms of Q sub n. The reason I want to look at this because I want to write everything as a function of Q instead of uh, B, okay? So we're going to write it with Q. In that case, B sub zero changes to Q sub zero, which is the same as A, and it's normally zero for uh, patients. The lowercase c constant is 100. What remains in the body is 30% or 0.3. Now, if I want Q sub n plus one, okay? If I want the third tablet, I'm going to make up a table. And obviously the first one is 100. 30% of that, that means 30 remains, and I add 100, so I get 130 for the second case. 30% of that remains, that means 39, and I add 100, I get 139. Uh, for this part, uh, B, I'm going to change it to Q, so Q sub n plus 1 is R Q sub n plus C, and I plug in the given, R is a 0.3 and lowercase c is 100. That's the answer for to part B. And for part C, it's a solve uh, the formula for Q sub n as a function of n, Q sub zero, we knew it was zero in the first place. So 
In this case, instead of B sub N, we're gonna use Q sub N. So in this formula, we change the B to Q. Uh, replace the Q sub zero with zero, or all those R's with what we found here, which is 0.3 and lowercase c with 100. We're gonna evaluate this, and since this is zero, this goes to zero. One minus 0 0.3 is 0 0.7. We put it underneath 100, which is the same as 1000 over seven, because the divisor is not supposed to have the decimal or the denominator. Uh, use part C to find Q sub three. So basically what happens here if you use n equals one, should give you this one. n equals two, this one. n equals three gives you the third one. So use that. I'm going to leave it for you to do it. And it must give you 139. Just as an example, if I put one here, 0.3 to the power of n becomes 0.3. One minus that 0.7 times 1,000 divided by seven is 100. Finally, so we want to find the limit here. And again, everybody remembers when we apply the limit to this piece, because 0.3, the base is between uh, negative one and one, the limit makes this guy go to zero. Again, the effect of limit on this is that this goes to zero. 1000 over seven is the precise answer. And with bunch of decimals, this is the answer. What does it mean? If this antibiotic is taken every eight hours, and that's really the, the key that eight hours play, it will never get beyond this much, 142.857 milligrams of antibiotic, because perhaps for that patient, it's not good to go beyond that. All right, uh, because uh, if you plug in, you get infinity over infinity, but because T is approaching infinity and you want to find the limit of a rational expression, uh, you divide by highest degree term in the denominator, which is T squared. So this is going to infinity over infinity. The process class, let me erase that the process to find limits are as follows. Number one, you plug in and you get to a number, you're done. Number two, uh, you plug in zero over a number is zero and you're done. Number three, a number over zero, you get infinity minus infinity, you're done. And finally, most of the time we end up with infinity minus infinity, infinity over infinity, zero over zero, all of them are some sort of indeterminate form, which means you use your algebraic techniques to uh, come up with the answer. So I hope everybody is okay with that so we can move on. The technique is to divide by t-square. So when we do that, all of this go to zero except this one. First of all, simplify this one, this one, this one, this one, all of this. Each one when you apply the limit goes to zero, except the one, zero over one is zero. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, again, it's infinity over infinity. However, because the variable is approaching infinity, the technique is to divide by T. Uh, when we do that and simplify, these two pieces go to zero. The, numer the numerator is infinity plus any number is infinity and divided by any positive value is infinity. So it really doesn't change anything. The answer is infinity. In this case, if you plug in, you get infinity minus infinity, one of the indeterminate forms. The technique is to multiply by the conjugate and divide by it. 
this expression in red is equal to one and it's fine. We keep the denominator and we multiply the numerator and we get the following square root of x squared plus one quantity squared minus x squared. So it comes out, these two cancel each other. And now if you plug in infinity, the denominator is infinity plus infinity and any number over that is equal to zero. So in this case, we ended up having zero as the answer. Now, when we plug in, e to the power of minus infinity becomes zero because a to the power of minus m equals one over a to the power of m, e to the power of minus t is one over e to the power of t, and therefore e to the power of minus infinity is one over e to the power of infinity, which makes it zero, and the answer is 12 over four or three. In this case, if we plug in, we notice is infinity over negative infinity. Because it's a fractional format, we treat it as a rational function and we notice t is approaching infinity. We divide by highest value in the denominator, which is e to the power of t, okay? So, we do that, we get this one. And we simplify, we get this one. Needless to say, as t goes to infinity, these two pieces go, each one goes to zero, positive one over negative three is the final answer or negative one third. Plug in, you get infinity over infinity. The technique is factoring. We factor the x out. It results in infinity times infinity minus one, which is again infinity. In the previous page, infinity minus infinity ended up giving us zero, and now we have a different answer, infinity. In this case, again, if you work it out, you get infinity over minus infinity, but more importantly, we notice that x is approaching infinity. This is a rational function. The technique is to divide by highest degree term in the denominator, and we do the math, okay? We simplify, and we notice, this is important to see. When you plug in infinity, the numerator becomes infinity plus one, the denominator is zero minus one, and the effect is it becomes negative infinity because you're dividing infinity by a negative value. That is extremely important. So limits of functions at finite numbers, given the graph of a function, state the value if they exist of the following. And reminding you of the one-sided limit, the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left and as x approaches a from the right. If they are identical, then the limit of f of x as x approaches a exists. We are interested in finding the limit as x approaches two. So we are going to look at the one-sided limit. If we look at the left side of a two, It's moving us towards this point, having the y coordinate three. The right side of two, it's moving us towards this point, having y coordinate equals one. Since they are different, the limit of g of x as x approaches two does not exist. 
Uh, we are interested in the limit of g of x as x approaches the five. That's why we look at the one-sided limit again. If you look at the left side of five, you're moving this way. If you're approaching five from the right, we move in this way. And in both cases, we are moving towards this hole, which has the same y coordinate in both cases, namely two. Therefore, the limit of g of x as x approaches five does exist and it's equal to two. What you need to notice if we assume this is about 1.4, and this is a solid point, g of five is 1.4, which is not equal to the limit value of two. However, according to definition of a continuity, limit of f of x as x approaches a must be equal to f of a, it's not. So the function is discontinuous at x equals two as well as x equals five. However, g of x can be continuous at x equals five. Yes, if what? If we redefine g of five to be two, this is a removable discontinuity because there is this hole. And if we redefine this, it can cover the hole we are in good shape. However, if you look at this case, there is a jump. So not only it's a jump and it therefore remains discontinuous, you can't fix it. Uh, even g of two is not known. As we look at uh, these graphs, um, I want to remind you of a definition of a VA short for vertical asymptote. The limit of f of x when x approaches a or a from the left or a from, from the right gives you negative or positive infinity. The vertical asymptote has the equation x equals a. So as you can see for number two, we're going to go down to negative infinity. And for number five, up to infinity. And negative three depends on the left side negative, but that on the right side, positive infinity. And according to the equation of a vertical asymptote and its definition, this says x equals two, this says x equals five, this says x equals negative three, this says the same thing, are our vertical asymptotes. x equals two, x equals five, x equals negative three. All right, we are interested in finding the limit of square root of x plus three minus two over x minus one. I hope you notice if you plug in one, this becomes four minus four, square root of four, which is two minus two, zero, the bottom is zero. So zero over zero requires some sort of a algebraic technique. Algebraic technique is to multiply and divide by the conjugate. This expression equals one and it's okay. So first and foremost, This expression equals one and it's okay. Secondly, we're going to multiply these two in this format and we're not going to touch it. The numerator, when we touch it, we get square root of x plus three quantity squared minus two, two squared and x plus three comes out of the radical. Three and negative four add up to negative one. These two cancel each other. The numerator becomes one. When you plug in one here, square root of four becomes two and two, four. One fourth is the final answer. I want to look at these two limits at the same time uh, because both of them have the numerator as close to six and the denominator close to zero. Please understand uh, whether we have uh, 6.001 or uh, 5.999 makes no difference. If your number, if the number that you're dealing with is positive, both sides are positive. If the number you're dealing with is negative, both sides is negative. The only number that the left side is negative and the right side is positive is zero. So the problem is the denominator. And that's why we have to figure out what we have here. If you put six from the right, for example, seven, eight, nine, or better yet, 6.1 minus six, that gives you positive 0.1. So this is six over zero from the right. Whereas here, 
a six from the left like five, so 5.9 minus six is minus 0.1. So this is six over zero from the left. Both of them are infinity, but this is positive, this is negative infinity. So that's why you wanna know zero from the left versus right. What is the limit of ln of x squared minus 16 as x approaches four from the right? If you put four, you get 16 minus 16 makes it zero from the right makes it zero from the right. Now, just to make sure you know the answer, I'm gonna remind you of the graph because elementary functions, we should know all the graphs. Here's the graph of y equals ln x. And as x approaches zero uh, from the right, okay, then it goes to negative infinity, giving rise to a vertical asymptote, which is the y-axis or x equals zero. We want to find this limit. Obviously, if you plug it, you get zero over zero. And the technique is factoring because, of course, it is the factoring, but x is approaching negative five. Therefore, we should look for the factor of x plus five. We can easily factor the numerator into x times x plus five, denominator into x plus five times x minus five. And these two cancel each other. When we plug in negative five, it gives us negative five over negative 10 or one half. You're dealing with a complex fraction. When you replace the x with three, you get zero over zero. The, so this is a complex fraction. The technique would be to multiply and divide by LC. When we do that, we keep the denominator intact as a product. Then we multiply this by the top, we get X minus three. These two cancel each other. And when we apply the three, we get one over nine. We want to evaluate this limit. All you have to do, plug in. When you plug in, you get square root of 16, which is four. So sometimes when we plug in, we get to the answer and it's fine. If we plug in number six into this function, we get zero over three equals zero. It's important to write zero over three because if you just write zero, I'm not too sure if it's right because I don't want anybody to mix it up with zero over zero and things of that nature. So it is zero over three, which makes it zero. However, if you look at this example, this you plug in, you get zero over zero which is indeterminate. Therefore, you're gonna multiply and divide by the conjugate of the numerator. Now, what happens to the denominator? Nothing, you just multiply it. Keep it as the format that you see. But if we multiply these two, Or the nine plus h under the radical. That means square root of 49 plus h gets squared up minus seven squared 49 and negative 49 cancel each other. H and h cancel each other. The numerator becomes one. If I apply the zero, square root of 49 is seven plus seven is 14. And the answer is one over 14. If you plug in, you get zero over zero. The technique is factoring and it's really not difficult because this is a prime number, everybody. So you should recognize this as X and two X. And then just, you know, play with number 12 and the middle term and come up with the answer. You should recognize this one as a prime number, therefore x and 3x. And this is pretty simple. All you have to do, 
cut the minus four into pieces, two and two, or uh, one and four, one of them negative. However, I want to add something else. X is approaching negative four, everybody. And we have zero over zero. This means we must have a factor of x plus four, where both at top and the bottom. Normally that's the case. So that makes life very easy when it comes to factoring. So three times negative four is negative 12 and negative one is negative 13. Two times negative four is negative five and positive three makes it negative five. And this becomes 13 over five. I want to explain what we see in this page as we have already. All of this rise over run. You have a blue line, you have two points come up with the slope. When Q approaches P, the secant line becomes the tangent line. So the tangent line is the limiting position of secant line, PQ as Q approaches P. And therefore, M of tangent line is the limit of M of PQ as Q approaches P or the formulas that you see here. To come up with the equation of a tangent line, we can write this, but Given the various format for the line, I'm going to stick with the point slope, and I'm not going to even memorize that. That's the way you should do that. It's very fast. It's very easy. For example, if I want to find the equation of a tangent line for the parabola y equals x squared at this pair, and by the way, the pair is given x comma y. Even if x is given, that's good enough. You can plug in. For example, if they said x is 5, y becomes 25. Notice that a is 1, f of x is x squared, and I'm going to find the slope. And I use one of those methods first. So if I stick with this one, I'm interested in m or f prime of 1, replace the f of x with x squared. Factor this one into x minus 1, x plus 1. Needless to say, if you plug in, you get 0 over 0. These two cancel each other, and we get 2. This is, the, this is the calculus part. The next is elementary y minus y1 is m times x minus x of 1. You work it out, you're done. The thing is, if you try with this pair, it just shows this process is right, doesn't tell you anything about this. So I want to look at the second method for practice. Uh, we did that in class. Again, we're going to do that where A is 1. And so you want to evaluate the function at 1 plus h. So you get 1 plus h squared. And that is 1 plus 2h plus h squared. Uh, you get rid of 1 and negative 1. You factor the h from the numerator. h cancels out. And if you plug in 0, you get the same 2 that you got here. I just wanted to show you how to arrive at two, two different ways. The distance in feet of an object from a starting point is given by S of t equals 2t squared minus 5t plus 40, where t is time in seconds. What is the average velocity of the object from 2 to 4 seconds? This is elementary algebra. We want S of a 4 minus S of a 2 over 4 minus 2, which means plug in 4, evaluate it. Plug in 2, evaluate it. The bottom is just 2. When we go through the process, we get seven units of the numerator feet over the units of the denominator second, seven feet per second. What is the instantaneous velocity of the object at four seconds? Before we move on, I want to remind you, in part A, they are giving us two points in time, even if they don't say average, that's what it means. 
In the second part, they are giving us one point in time, even if they don't mention instantaneous. That's what it means. You have to take care. You have to take the derivative of the function at a equals four. Uh, for this one, again, we have done this before. You remember that you plug in four plus h. That means two times four plus h squared minus five times four plus h plus 40. And then you plug in four or better yet, just reuse the fact that it was 52. Uh, four plus h squared is 16 plus eight h plus h squared. Uh, distribute the two, distribute the negative five and put them all together. You notice Number 32, negative 20, 40, minus 52, they add up to zero. 16H minus 5H is 11H. You factor out the H for this one and 2H squared. You drop the common factor of H. And now if you plug in zero, you get 11 feet per second. Continuity, here's the definition. A function is continuous at A if the limit of f of x as x approaches A equals f of A. One sided limit indicates a function has a limit if the limit of f of x as x approaches A from the left and right are identical. So this is a piecewise defined function. And we wanna see if g of x is continuous at x equals minus two, y or y not. The question is, y at x equals minus two. Uh, this is a piecewise defined function. The top piece is a linear function. The bottom piece is a linear function. And therefore the domain is all real numbers for each piece. So for the top piece, which is defined all the way to negative two, it is also continuous from negative infinity to negative two. For the bottom that is defined from negative two on, it's also continuous from negative two to infinity but we have to check the end point, namely negative two. We start with the functional value. Which of these pieces are we using for the functional value? The one with the equality, therefore we're gonna use that. If I plug in negative two, I get negative two. I want the left-sided limit the one with the less than, so we plug in into this and we get negative one and three, they add up to two. For the right side, the one which is larger than, we use this one. And when we plug in, we get negative three. Uh, clearly the limit from the left and right are different, therefore the limit does not exist. Because the limit does not exist, the function is not continuous at x equals negative two. Is g of x is continuous at x equals negative two from the right? Well, Here's the functional value. Here's the limit from the right. Because the functional value and the limit from the right are identical, we say the function is continuous at x equals negative two from the right. 